Okay. Um, all right. I'm oh, so sorry. Um, this jumped. All right. Um, welcome everyone to this amazing learning session um, titled Leveraging Gender Norms um, as a Catalyst for um, Women Agency, Women Agency and Livelihood. Um, but then as it's part of the Gender and Inclusion Summit Learning Workshop, we thought to just uh, give you a run through of what the Gender and Inclusion Summit is all about. So the Gender and Inclusion Summit will be held this year from November 28 to 29, 2023, and it will be held in the city of Abuja. The theme for this year is Building Bridges, um, Advancing Gender and Inclusion Through the Intersection of Trade and Health. Again, welcome everyone um, to this learning session. Um, um, la we had an amazing gender and inclusion summit last year titled Connecting the Dot for a Gender and Inclusion Summit. So after we were able to connect the dots, we realized that it might just be time to, um, last year we were able to connect the dots. And from what we found, we realized that it is actually time to build the bridges to the dots that we connected. So we decided to have this theme or we selected this theme based on everything happening globally and really understanding that a healthy population is a, a healthy population is a productive population and a productive population as well is a healthy population and also to, to just you know just look into issues around health insurance the relationship between trade and just the whole um, wide spectrum, you know, of events that surrounds um, this theme. Um, this is a picture from last year. We had a very wide um, spectrum of audience attend. Um, and because it was so successful, we knew that we had to make it an annual event. So this is just gives us a, a like an overview of the summit delivery strategy. It will be held in person and as an hybrid, like as a hybrid session. So in case you're not physically present in Abuja, you can still attend this um two days um gender and inclusion summit um scheduled for November 28 and 29. Um, it's going to consist of plenary sessions, panel sessions, breakout sessions oral and um, poster presentations, skill building workshops, which this is part of, as well as a creative and arts competition and exhibition. You really want to be there um, as well. So the, the, the Gender and Inclusion Summit is a platform where we can advance gender inclusive approaches, you know, that help us harness the potential for trade, you know, to promote economic participation, reduce inequality and improve access opportunities as well as innovative approaches to help us build this bridge in healthcare finance gaps and access to quality healthcare um, services as well. Um, these are just a wide spectrum of themes that we are looking um, that we're going to explore this year, ranging from intersectionality in trade and health, you know, trying to understand how we can address gaps in gender inclusive programming, trying to understand you know, adaptive approaches to disability, inclusive development, you know, also very topical is the care economy, you know, trying to understand how we can advance women's economic empowerment, you know, leveraging innovate, innovation in the care economy. We're also going to have something around how we can advance digital inclusion in trade and health, also something around addressing missing opportunities for sustainable de development um, in the agricultural sector. And we're also going to have something around um, how we can advance best practices for gender and inclusion in the creative and media industry. And we're doing this because we realized last year that there's so much inequality in the creative and media ecosystem in Nigeria. Also, there's going to be a youth summit which should be centered around prioritizing education, learning and empowerment. We are also going to have something around the role of trade in promoting gender equality and the SDG. Um, we're also going to look at something around gender inclusiveness in access and utilization of healthcare services. And um, we're going to, so which this session is um, around, um, shifting harmful social norms to advance livelihood and better health outcomes. So this is where this something um, um, 
is around. So last year, we had a very, very successful event. We had over 700 physical people in the room last year and about 9,406 people virtually connect. We had a wide range of stakeholders, and this is one of our the highlights of, um, of last year, where we had the Minister of Agri, the Minister of Finance, the World Bank country um, rep, as well as the UN country rep, you know, in attendance. So um, just a little more on the sessions that will be had this year is a two-year event. Um, to today events and you do not want to miss it and different opportunities to partner and here is a team that um, um, planned last year's gender and inclusion summit so it really takes um, a village I will just stop here over Dr Sasui Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon everyone. I'd like to warmly warmly welcome you to um, this very important um, webinar. Um, we consider this webinar really important to us because um, at the center of the conversations that we're going to be having um, at the Gender and Inclusion Summit this year would be um, issues relating to social norms, livelihood, agency. And yeah, I mean, I don't need to tell you anything about it because that's why we're all here to learn. And um, But just to say that this is really at the center of our conversation around trade because we're able to look at, you know, gender norms that really um, impact on, you know, the capacity of women to achieve um, livelihoods or, you know, financial independence. Um, but more importantly is the fact that these conversations will feed organically into the summit so that for those of us coming to the summit or connecting online, we can actually start the conversation today, reflect on our thoughts um, around this very important topic, and then bring, you know, you know, kind of take those conversations further um, into the main summit. Um, and um, I'm not going to waste any time to introduce our guests. Um, because we had to, you know, we have the best in the room to um, do justice to this topic. But before I do that, I'd like to encourage um, everyone who is connecting today to feel free to drop, you know, a note in the chat box, you know, where you walk, where you're connecting from. Let's get to meet you and even engage um, ahead of the summit, you know, what you do. Um, and then if you have any questions or comments, you know, ahead or while the presentation is going on, please also feel free to drop that in the chat box. Um, this is also an opportunity for us to network, get to know ourselves, because I assume that um, we have gender advocates or aspiring gender advocates or, you know, experts in the sector, you know, connecting today. So um, without wasting time, I want to introduce um, our speaker. Um, and I'll just, I hope I have permission to share my screen. Okay. Okay, so Dr. Sorry, that has gone off. Um, one second. So Dr. Beton has over 20 years of international development and research experience um, on gender integration, gender equality in education, human trafficking, female empowerment, and gender-based violence. She has managed projects and conducted research about women and gender. She has co-authored two girls' mentoring guides and authored several peer-reviewed publication articles on human trafficking. Dr. Beton is the director of FHI 360's gender department, where she provides strategic leadership, programmatic and technical leadership, and gender technical assistance across development sectors and geographic locations, and is overseeing the implementation of FHI 360's gender equality and social inclusion framework 2.0. Con currently, she serves as an adjunct professor at George Washington University, where she's been teaching graduate courses on human trafficking and gender and development since 2006. Dr. Beton holds a PhD in government and politics from 
University of Maryland College Park. So let's welcome, warmly welcome her. And just to let you know that we've broken the presentation into four parts. Um, so what we're going to do is as she takes um, different you know, segments of her presentations, we'll take a pause for very brief reflections or just one or two quick questions just to ensure that we keep the room interactive and then she moves to the next part. But at the end of all the presentations, we will now have time to take um, questions and answers. So keep the questions coming and keep the conversations going in the Q&A and in the chat box while I hand over to Dr. Beton. You're welcome. Thank you so much, doctor. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Cami and the organizers. Oh, it looks like it looks like my background is backwards. It, um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's all right. <laughs> it's okay. Yes. Okay. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. My name is Andrea Bertone, and uh, as was mentioned, I work for an international development organization called FHI Three Hundred and Sixty. We have global offices in nearly 60 countries, and we are doing international development work in health, education, civil society, humanitarian and crisis response, among many other topics, climate change. Um, so I have been focusing on leading our work on gender and inclusion for many years, and it's, a, it's really a pleasure to be able to uh, speak to the experiences that I've had over the years uh, and to be able to promote the uh, ideas of gender equity and equality and social inclusion. Uh, and I also want particularly to thank uh, Kemi because she was my student earlier this year in a wonderful course called Gender Pro. And uh, it provides that foundation for aspiring professionals uh, to be a gender advisor in development work. Uh, so it's it's really wonderful uh, and um, it's an honor to have been asked to come and speak with you. So I am going to share my screen. Um, just give me one moment, please. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. So I'm going to be talking about uh, leveraging gender norms as catalysts for women's agency and livelihood. And while I have some aspects of my presentation which are going to be me speaking, I do hope that I can rely on some of our program, uh, some of our participants in this seminar to actually participate by writing the answers to some questions that I will pose in the chat. Uh, so I wanted to make it a little bit interactive and, and really get the feedback from all of you because really, gender norms uh, requires a conversation and it requires an investigation and gender norms are different in in all societies and even within societies can be different from one place to another so it's a it's a very interesting uh, topic to be talking about um so I'm going to provide an introduction to some of these terms that we are discussing and Sometimes they're used interchangeably. Sometimes people use the term equity or equality, but they do mean different things. And so I wanted to encourage you all to think about the difference and actually the implications that the difference has to the work that we're doing. But before I do that, I wanted to raise some important points about the term gender. Uh, gender and women are often used interchangeably. I think we can all think of times when people say, oh, that's a gender issue, but 
really, you know that they mean it has something to do with women and girls. But in fact, gender is something that uh, affects everyone. Uh, everyone has some kind of gender identity, whether you think about it or not. It, it definitely is the case that we all have a gender identity. We all do uh, act in certain ways that adhere to certain norms that we've been taught in our lives, starting from when we are small children and continuing through our entire life. Sometimes even these norms change. So I wanted to identify a few really important points about um, the difference between gender and woman or gender and even the term sex. Uh, sometimes the term gender and sex are used interchangeably. Um, mm. But essentially, uh, gender is a social construct that refers to the relations between and among the sexes based on their relative roles in family and society. So the concept of gender varies across cultures. It can be static, and deeply entrenched, so mean, meaning it doesn't change and people are adhering to these norms uh, of gender very care closely, or it can be dynamic and open to change over time. And we can often, we can think of things that might often change uh, the, the, the way that we express our gender, perhaps even um, social media, or television, um, or other forms of technology, or or even um, bad things like war and conflict, all of these things can change gender identity and gender norms. The next point I want to make is that gender roles are embedded in legal, social, religious, and cultural in institutions, and also our traditions. Challenges to existing gender inequities and levels of inequality can be strongly resisted. Many of us are very aware of um, ways in which some cultures and some societies resist change, especially when it comes to the way um, men and women and girls and boys are told the way they're supposed to act uh, because these dynamics are often deeply in, rooted in the institutions and traditions or the laws. Uh, so again, thinking about the ways in which um, religious institutions dictate how we should dress if we're a woman, how we should act, how what we should be doing at certain times in our lives, uh, and other types of trad cultural traditions. The next point that it really is very important for those who are working on gender issues from um, within a professional sense is that gender relations and roles are very context specific and they cannot be assumed. We cannot assume that, that the gender roles in even in one part of a country are the same in another part of the country. So really we need to investigate gender relations. And when I say investigate, really I mean they need to be researched. So we, we need to do that research, um, that investigation so that we have that um, up-to-date uh, understanding of these issues. And then as I said before, gender and women are not synonyms. So we shouldn't should not be using gender and women interchangeably as terms because uh, gender norms affect men and boys and gender gender norms are assumed by men and boys as well. Um, however, beyond just the binary discussion of men and women, boys and girls, uh, we have other terms about which many of us are aware and I think are really important to mention because it's something that as a, as a global community, we talk about often. We know that people who identify differently and express themselves differently are often in very disadvantaged situations or are affected by very um, 
uh, strict laws against the way uh, against the way they're acting or the way that they express themselves. But it is important to say that the dominant discourse and development around gender is the relationship between men and women. These are very binary notions of gender. However, I know many of you are familiar with the lesbian, gay, um, transgender, queer, uh, bisexual discussions. <clears throat> so lesbian, gay, bisexual are about our sexual orientation. So who you are attracted to sexually. Transgender and queer is about gender identity or how you identify. Do you identify as a man or a woman or do you have a more fluid gender identity? We cannot assume sexual orientation with a gender identity. Okay, so those two things are not the same thing. And um, in the development community, the history of the way we address or the way we work with transgender individuals or what are often termed as men who have sex with men um, are that these are members of populations that are prior priority or key populations because they're seen as highly vulnerable to HIV or um, uh, other um, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, they face a lot of stigma and discrimination. So the international development community has been looking at these individuals primarily with um, a health lens. However, we have, in my opinion, need to be aware of all of their life experiences, not only, you know, what they're um, more likely to be contracting in terms of a disease, we have to look at their experiences in their, you know, their full life, their education, their employment, etc. So these um, discussions around gender are have been expanding in the international community. And um, we should all be aware whether we agree or understand, they're definitely there. Okay, I'm just going to give you all a, a moment to take a look at this graphic, uh, which is kind of an interesting, fun way of explaining the different parts of gender issues. So uh, this is called a genderbred person. It is a play on a, uh, a delicious type of cookie called a gingerbread man. Uh, which we have in, in Western countries. I don't know if um, you have it in other parts of the world, but there, there's this delicious cookie called a gingerbread man. Okay, so, they, so this group changed their gingerbread man to be a genderbred person um, to show that, you know, your identity is how you're feeling, your orientation is how you feel about other people, your sex is your, are your biological, um, uh, you know, your biology. So what sexual organs do you have? And then your expression is how you express yourself to the world. How do you dress? How do you act? How do you speak? Okay, so this is an interesting graphic. I uh, recommend for those of you who are interested in this type of work, uh, to do a little bit more investigating on these types of graphics. Let me just stop and check to see if there's any questions. Um, okay, there's no there's no particular questions yet, which is fine. Just wanted to monitor that. Okay, you know, before we continue, maybe this is a good place just to pause quickly and see if there's any questions, comments, uh, or thoughts about what I've covered so far. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put um, in the Q&A box and then we can take that quickly before we proceed.
Okay, we're getting lots of clapping. <laughs> yes, so I think we should proceed and then, yes. yes, okay, that's great. Okay, great. Um, okay, we're going to do a little, a little fun game. Ooh. I hope this works and it will require that you all are writing into the the chat your answers to this. But uh, this exercise, this game is called Vote With Your Feet. Now, if we were together in a room, I would ask everyone to stand. I would ask, uh, I would be telling you, okay, I'm going to say a statement and you are going to decide whether you agree or disagree with this statement. And this is, and there's no right or wrong answers. This is absolutely how you feel about this particular issue based on your own experiences, okay? And the idea behind this exercise is for you to examine your own gender issues. These are your personal gender issues. And again, neither is right or wrong. The only rule that you have is that you have to to say whether you agree or disagree, and you can't be in the middle. Okay, so let's try this quick, uh, oops, this quick game. And I'm going to say the first statement. I'll even put it in the chat so that uh, in case you want to consider it, you can think about it for, for a couple of moments. But the first question, or the first statement rather, is the following. Women are naturally better parents than men. Okay, so I just put it into the chat. And I would like for our participants to write in the chat whether you agree with this statement and why, or if you disagree with the statement and why. You don't have to write a lot can just be one or two lines, but I'm going to give everyone 30 seconds to tell us why they agree with the statement, women are naturally better parents than men, or whether you disagree, okay? So, um, okay, so you can put your answers in the Q&A, that's the, that's the, um, the directions. Okay, so I see uh, Dunazwe, you agree with this. That's great. Who else agrees? Who else disagrees with the statement? Women are naturally better parents than men. And again, I'm waiting for your answers in the Q&A. You don't have to write more than one or two lines. Tell us if you agree and why you agree, or if you disagree and why you disagree. Okay, I'm getting a lot more answers, wonderful. So we have a lot of uh, disagrees. This is a social construct based on traditional roles. Interesting. Okay, we have disagree, but then we also have a couple of agrees. Women are nurturers and this makes them better parents. Okay, interesting. Um, we have someone saying, I agree. They, I think it, think they mean they spend more time with children. Uh, we have Michael Daramola who says um, they disagree. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of these great comments. And this is about right. Every time I do this small exercise with people all over the world, I really do get a mix of agrees and disagrees. And it's purely based on your experience and your perceptions about the role of women as caregivers, as nurturers, 
uh, or the role of men as caregivers and nurturers. And if you think about it, many cultures don't give enough value to men as caregivers and nurturers, and that those are completely related to gender norms. And I really like uh, someone's comment that these this is a social construct. So we we're creating this idea that women should be better parents. Um, but again, others think about it in terms of being much more biological. And thank you again for your comments. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to give you one more statement, and I'm going to ask you to think about it uh, a little bit more. And um, again, let me know if you agree or disagree. So I'm going to put the statement in the chat, and then I will also read it. So the statement is. Men will feel threatened if too many women are in leadership roles. Men will feel threatened if too many women are in leadership roles. Please take 30 seconds to let us know whether you agree or disagree with this statement. Men will feel threatened if too many women are in leadership roles. And again, just a couple of lines why you agree or disagree. Okay, I'm I'm waiting just to hear back from you all about whether you're agreeing or disagreeing with the statement that men will feel threatened if too many women are in leadership roles. Okay, so we, in Nigeria's context, um, Faye Kemi is agreeing with that. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, someone else says, I agreed because men always want to be in control. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. When this happens, if ever happens, if it ever happens, society would have to evolve to cope with it. It seems to be true for now. Okay. I agree. Glass ceilings had been an age long challenged in organizations and even society at large culture has made women to be followers and leaders especially in africa okay and then uh, the last one i'm reading here is uh, agree men's ego and society makes them want to be in charge of resources wow okay so we have a lot of people agreeing that men would feel threatened if too many women were in leadership roles. Well, that is interesting and something, again, for us to consider. This is all related to gender norms and how societies develop gender norms, how people, how men um, and boys are raised to feel certain way and to be told that they should be acting in a certain way, even if they don't want to act in that way, they're told that they have to act that way. And the same with women and girls. And that has uh, implications for future opportunities for men and women or others who identify differently. All of these have implications for our agency and our livelihood. Okay, so moving on, and, and um, let me just thank you all for your excellent comments, and I really enjoy reading about your perspectives. I'm going to move on to discussing, so what does it mean to conform to a gender identity? What are the norms and expectations that a particular community 
society, culture has constructed around what it means to be a woman or a man, a girl or a boy? Or what happens when someone does not conform to this gender binary? What kind of implications uh, does that person face? Another question that I would like to pose to you is, can these norms change? How do they change? What happens when people don't adhere to the norms or they're transgressed in some way? How does society respond? Does it respond uh, kindly upon these individuals or do people try to clamp down on anyone who is transgressing norms that society has, has set? The sanctions for not adhering to gender expectations vary across cultures and over time and inevitably intersect with sanctions associated with other individual defining factors, such as skin color, class, age, and sexual orientation. Okay, so what kind of norms that we're told, for example, as an adolescent girl, these are not the same norms that we may have as a middle-aged woman or an older woman. So norms change over a person's lifetime, and they also intersect with other points of your identity. So that makes it even more complicated. Um, discussions around people, and especially children who are gender non-conforming, people who don't conform to these very strict definitions of what it means to be a man or a woman are very different in each country and we know them to be quite sensitive. Um, people have been jailed or worse for expressing themselves or loving people that they that people tell them that they're not supposed to love. So we definitely need to investigate all of these norms and we need to be really careful when we're investigating them. I would like to take a moment just to uh, go through the differences between the terms gender equity and gender equality. We use those terms again interchangeably, and I think it's it it bears thinking about what what the difference is. Okay, so. Gender equity means fairness of treatment for women and men according to their respective needs. This may include equal treatment or treatment that is different, but which is considered equivalent in terms of rights, benefits, obligations, and opportunities. So another way of thinking about equity is that it is a process for attaining equality. And how can we ensure fairness? Well, sometimes we have to take strategies and measures to compensate for historical and social disadvantages that prevent women and men from otherwise operating on a level playing field. So sometimes we might think about um, quotas, for example, uh, for women to fill certain places in a legislative body. This would be an example of gender equity because we are creating, we are um, imposing a, 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 um, a situation where we're elevating women because otherwise they would not necessarily be able to access those um, those opportunities. So sometimes we have to create those kinds of opportunities to elevate certain individuals who have been historically disadvantaged. Now, if we look at the definition then of gender equality, we can say that equality between men and women and among other genders entails the concept that all human beings are free to develop their personal abilities and make choices without the limitations set by stereotypes, rigid gender roles, and prejudices. 
different behavior, aspirations, and needs of women and men are considered valued and favored equally. So it doesn't mean that women and men have to become all of the same thing or act exactly in the same way, but really that their rights, responsibilities, and opportunities are equal and do not depend on whether they were born male or female. Okay, so I should never be told that because I'm a woman, I cannot pursue a certain interest or if if I want to try to do it and I can do it physically and mentally, then I should have the right to be able to do that. Okay, so it's really about the rights, responsibilities and opportunities being equal. So I have a couple of um, graphics that also are going to try to convey this difference between equity and equality. One way of looking at it is that gender equity are the strategies, the means for attaining an end goal of gender equality. Equity is giving everyone this, uh, what they need to be successful and equality is treating everyone else the same. Now, I realize that this is a little simplistic, but again, it's a beginning point of conversation, okay? Here's another graphic. I think probably many of you have seen this graphic, but it's a, just a, another way of looking at the difference between inequality, equality, equity, and even the con other concepts such as liberation. Um, so you'll see on the left side, you have four individuals, they're all different heights, uh, and they're all standing in front of a wall. Now, what, what appears to be the man is the only he is the only person who can see over the wall so he has an advantage because he's taller now um in the next uh square you have an example of equality you've given everyone exactly the same uh resource to raise them up okay but we still have the situation where the two children cannot see over the wall or the two people who are shorter. Um, now the woman has been raised up a little bit. She can sort of see over the wall and the man, of course, definitely can still see over the wall. In the next square, you have now what would be considered equity. You've, you've looked at all of the disadvantages that each person holds and each person to bring them up to the same point has been given a different number of boxes to stand on. Um, so we've adjusted the resources given to certain individuals to bring them up all to the same level. And then of course, in the last square, the wall is completely gone. And that would be, uh, we might consider that to be sort of the breaking down of, of um, uh, disadvantages that exist within institutions and laws. Okay, so here's uh, again another graphic which is kind of interesting. We have one picture at the top left of inequality where you have the tree is sort of bending in a certain direction, unequal access to opportunities. Then in the square next to it, Equity is that um, you've provided uh, different size ladders for the children to pick the apples. Equality is you've given the same, you've given everybody the same resources, but that still has disadvantaged someone, the, the child on the right to be able to pick the apples. And then the last uh, square is that the system needs to be fixed in order to offer equal access, both in tools and opportunities. Because the tree was bent, so now we're showing that we had to push the tree over a little bit, pull it in one direction. We've given the same uh, level ladders and now everyone can pick from the tree. 
So there's there's different concepts that are being communicated in these pictures. One more here, again, a picture of four individuals riding bicycles. The top, uh, oops, sorry. The top is um, an example of equality, I'm sorry, equity, where everyone is given a different type of bicycle that adheres to their abilities. And then the one at the bottom is an example of equality where everybody gets the same bicycle, but not everyone can use it in the same way. Okay, I'm going to stop here again as a pause just to see if we have any comments or questions or thoughts about uh, any of these terms that I've raised. Yes, um, there's a question, a couple of questions um, in the chat. Okay. Um, so there's one that says, um, well, this is just a comment. So it says, which with each step, a part of inequality is mitigated. Um, but there's a question here that says, does this step need to be applied during recruitment of staff? So from equality and equity, which method will be best in recruitment processes? Mm, that's really interesting. Well, it's a very, it's an excellent question. And I would say that, <clears throat> excuse me, if your workplace has identified that you are, uh, you are really hiring many of the same types of people, uh, perhaps you're hiring more men than women or more women than men, or perhaps, <clears throat> excuse me, or perhaps you're hiring only from one ethnic group one religious group, then you need to figure out what are you doing in your recruitment processes that you seem to be attracting perhaps CVs from always one group, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to take some additional measures to reach out to places where um, people can be providing their CVs from groups that, that you lack uh, representation from. Um, so for example, let's say you are, you're only receiving CVs from men for certain types of positions. Well, in order to improve the way that, in, in, or um, increase the number of applicants, uh, you might, write the job description in a different way, or you might have uh, comments that you are welcoming CVs from, you know, men and women or all different groups. So it depends on how your job descriptions are written. And it also depends on where you're advertising your, your jobs. And you may have to take extraordinary steps to improve the way you do your recruitment. Uh, so I definitely think it, it affects that. Yes, thank you so much. That's really, that's really awesome. Um, and then maybe just one last question before you proceed. Um, so there's just a comment about men generally believe in equity, but not equality as they feel men are superior to women. Um, that's a comment. <laughs> Um, yes, I think I've heard that many times, you know, don't talk about equality, talk about equity. <laughs> okay. Um, but this question says, um, what is the difference between affirmative action and equity? As I was saying before, thank you for that question. We, it, it's, it's similar. Uh, those, those terms are related because Again, with affirmative action, you're recognizing that some group in your society has been disadvantaged. And so you need to figure out ways in which to raise those individuals up to bring them to the same point where others exist already. Uh, so, you know, affirmative action, sometimes it works 
well and sometimes it doesn't and I would say that it it's um it's not only sort of getting people physically into a space you also have to provide them with other resources and opportunities okay um, I will just um, hold on to the other questions so you can continue and then hopefully we can take these questions um, when you yeah. pause next or at the end. But really good questions. Please keep them coming in. I agree. Totally. Those are excellent questions. And I would love to come back to some of them uh, if we have time. Um, OK, so let me continue. With uh, additional conversations. So. Um, as an international development professional and someone who's worked on gender issues for many years, I truly believe that unequal gender norms create disadvantages for both men and women, for both boys and girls, and for those who uh, identify differently or are oriented differently. I do not believe unequal gender norms ever creates a better situation for men or over women. Even if men hold more power, in the end, it doesn't benefit men all the time to hold more power and have women have less power. And I wanted to talk a little bit about these concepts now. Okay, so um, as I mentioned before, we, as um, development professionals working on gender, we have a tool at our disposal called the gender analysis. Sometimes it's called a gender and social inclusion analysis, but uh, essentially it's a qualitative data collection effort using primarily interviews and focus group discussions to consider the different uh, roles that men and women play in society. Uh, and there are several domains of analysis that we might consider in our investigation, okay? Um, they include the laws, policies, and regulations, cultural norms and beliefs, gender roles and responsibilities, um, our expectations of ourselves and others and how we use our time, our access to and control over assets and resources, patterns of power and decision-making and other issues such as gender-based violence. Um, and so in that gender analysis, we're, we are having a systematic way of examining and investigating the differences in roles and norms for a lot of different people with, with different identities. Okay, so um, at sort of the base, we are going to include men, people, rather people who identify as women, people who identify as men, girls and boys, then we're going to have other categories of individuals that we want to include, such as men and women with disabilities or men and women who are, um, belong to ethnic minority groups, um, people who are who would consider themselves part of the LGBTQI plus uh, groups and other marginalized groups. So we want to bring all of these different people together in um, different kinds of focus group discussions, and we want to ex we want to explore what are the different levels of power that these individuals hold vis-a-vis -vis others, and then in different environments. So, looking at people's roles in the house, people's roles in the work environments, in the community, etc. Uh, we want to look at their different needs, the constraints and opportunities that they have, and then what impact that these differences have on their daily lives. When women are constrained with access to certain kinds of resources, or they're not able to fully make decisions about their own health or education, what impact does that have on their, on their lives? we know that it has very 
a deep impact on their lives. And we and we need to understand that so that we can then help develop ways in which we can mitigate those those challenges. Okay, so a gender analysis is a very important tool for someone who's in um, in the international development field and specifically working on on gender. Now, I wanted to take a moment to uh, consider or to discuss what are norms anyway, okay? So um, we talk about this term norm, but I just wanted to take a moment to consider like, well, what is it, you know? And, and then once we have an understanding of a norm, what is a gender norm? Okay, so to start with, a norm is a rule or a standard of behavior that is shared by members of a social group. Norms can be internalized, <clears throat> excuse me, meaning they are incorporated within the individual so that there's conformity without external rewards or punishments. Um, they can also be enforced by positive or negative sanctions from others, as we discussed before. Norms can be prescriptive, which means that they encourage positive behavior, or they can be proscriptive, which means they discourage negative behavior. And norms can also be agreed upon definitions of productive behaviors and mindsets that should be usual when a group is working together. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting example. Uh, wearing a bikini at a beach or a bathing suit as, at a beach is an acceptable behavior, but wearing one in a church would not be an acceptable behavior. So we, so we have certain rules that as a culture we decide upon, and then we have as a, a group have to enforce those kinds of rules. Otherwise, then people would just do whatever they want anytime they wanted, okay? So these are norms. Now, what then is a gender norm? What are gender norms? Gender norms are socially and culturally defined principles that govern the expected behavior of, of females and males. And here are some sort of big picture categories of what gender norms are governing they are governing what we wear. They are governing what kind of work we do. Okay, so are women able to be, uh, you know, mechanics? And can men do work that has traditionally been held by women? Or does our culture, whatever culture we live in, tell us that women are only allowed to do certain things? Only women are allowed to take care of children and men need to go and, and work outside of the home. Um, these gender norms, they tell us how we're supposed to be acting in certain environments. How do we act in a household setting? How do we work in, in a, a work setting? Gender norms also tell us where we're allowed to go. Okay, so are women allowed to be in certain spaces or are only men allowed to be in certain spaces? And again, if women are not allowed to be in certain spaces that provide uh, opportunities for learning, then women are at a disadvantage. Um, so these are just some big categories of what um, gender norms are telling us we're supposed to be doing. Okay, I want to pause uh, and do another um, small activity with you all. Okay, so in your experience, I want you if I can ask uh, your participation again, we'll just take a few moments of your time 
to identify activities or ways of acting or being uh, where men are only supposed to be doing this. Okay, and then I want you to identify activities where women should only be doing these things. And think about as you're typing, as you're answering, what, or this activity that I'm identifying, can another, can a woman do it too? Or can a man do it? Okay, so what kinds of activities do we put in these boxes? And then what happens when a woman wants to do something that's in the man's box or a man wants to do something that's in the woman's box? Okay, so I'm going to give you 30 seconds to identify certain activities, behaviors, places that only women or only men are allowed to participate in. And um, if you can put your answers in the Q&A, the open, the, the open space, that would be great. So again, we're putting answers into the Q&A that identify activities, places, things that only men are supposed to be doing and then only women supposed to, are supposed to be doing. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Danazwe. You answered, men are expected to be emotionally strong, provide for the house financially, be the protective figure at home, and highly engaged in leadership and productive roles. Thank you so much. Women can carry pregnancy and men, and men don't. Okay, great. Men are expected to be the leaders of the home. Okay, I... I challenge you and others to think about what does that exactly mean? And what, what does it mean for a man to be a leader of the home? And can women also lead a home or can they co-lead? Uh, women are emotionally stronger than, I'm gonna, I'm going to, <laughs> men, yes. Women are emotionally stronger than men. Okay, interesting. Um, however, we had a previous comment that the men were expected to be emotionally strong. So that's also very interesting. Religious leadership, women are not allowed. Women are normalized to play supportive, not leading roles. Women care more than men. Um, roles should not be based on gender, but capabilities. Okay, very good comment. Both men and women can be leader of the home. It just depends. Men are simple in nature while women are not simple in nature. That's very interesting. Men are expected to provide um, financial support. Women are, uh, men are expected to do the mechanical work and women do the caring work. I, I love that you're all writing that term expected, okay? Expectations are extremely strong variants in, that determine our behavior. Uh, we as individuals um, have expectations of ourselves because of what others have told us that we should do. And we have expectations of others. And these expectations are so strong, they really um, orient us in the way we act and what we do in our lives. Uh, I love all of these, I love all of these comments. Men are expected to cook, clean and care for the children. 
Okay, men are expected to be the ones in certain positions, i.e. you see men are allowed to be supervisors in certain projects, constructions, women are perceived to be weak and leading, even though we know that that's not true. That's a great point, okay? Our perceptions, our cultural perceptions don't always adhere to the truth or the reality rather of what we know to be true. Um, so thank you so much for all of these wonderful comments. Again, I uh, encourage you to think about all of these things that you've identified, you know, when, when the man, when the man's um, quote unquote uh, responsibilities move over into the women's box and vice versa, then what happens in in the society, what kinds of implications or sanctions uh, do people face? These are always very um, interesting issues that I'm considering. So thank you for your um, perspectives. I just wanna do a quick time check. Um, Kimmy, how are we doing with time? Um, we have about um, we have about um, 10, 15 more minutes. Okay, perfect. That's perfect timing. Uh, okay, so the next point um, that I want to make is, and again, I'm going to ask you all for examples of cultural norms that I have I have uh, encountered in gender analyses that I've done in countries all over the world. I've done gender analyses with local staff, uh, probably in about 10 different countries in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, several countries in the Middle East uh, and in Asia. So we obviously, every culture is different and unique we also but we do see patterns from different regions whereby gender inequality leads to certain types of activities behaviors practices so child marriage as we know is something that we can find in many cultures all over the world uh, and one of the reasons we see child marriage is because of gender inequality and gender uh, expectations. We see high rates of domestic violence and gender-based violence all over the world, again, as a result of gender inequality. We see high rates of stigma against people with disabilities and LGBTQI plus individuals as a result of gender inequality. Early initiation of sexual activity. We know that that's happening all over the world and the implications are can be very severe um, because it can lead to early pregnancy and um, uh, sexually transmitted infections and um, other, other issues that uh, usually young girls are facing. We see uh, that in many cultures, women and girls um, are not allowed to do certain things during pregnancy, or they're not allowed to eat certain things during their pregnancy, or they're uh, not given the ability to get to a health facility for antenatal care. So these are consistent things that I've seen in, in many different countries. Traditional roles of men and boys in the home and work environment, uh, again, don't always, they don't always provide uh, the best situation for men and boys. Um, if a certain culture is telling men and boys that they should be perpetrating violence against their partners, against other women, 
that doesn't help them and it doesn't help the women and girls okay but sometimes those traditional roles uh don't always serve men and boys in the best way um men and boys are told you know you must go out and find work uh well what if the man or the boy wants to pursue his studies and he doesn't want to necessarily get a job right away, but he's told by his, his family or his culture or his community that he has to do certain things. So we can be identifying a lot of different examples of how, of certain norms that dictate how people are supposed to act. And I've found this in, um, so many different studies that I've done around the world. And you probably could think of, of numerous norms um, from your own cultures that uh, dictate certain ways that people are supposed to act. Before we continue, I would love if you could give me one example from your own experience of a cultural or gender norm that dictates how you or yeah how you are supposed to act or how you have been expected to act so um it doesn't have to be necessarily very personal it could can can be general uh, but i would love to hear if if you could just take 30 seconds to write in the chat uh, how do you think unequal gender norms has impacted you personally in terms of what you have been told you're supposed to do or not supposed to do. And I'm going to monitor the chat. Okay, so if you can, if you can write uh, one way in which you feel that you have been constrained because of what you, because of some norm, that would be very interesting. Okay, um, thank you. Decision making in the home where it is the culture expects that the man makes the decision. It has affected me in academic selection and participating for different programs. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. How have unequal gender norms affected you? Women should not go to the river and fetch water with a black pot okay it's affected you in um, your career progression um, pregnant women are mistreated because of their biological clock and some are laid off from work uh, not being able to pursue your dreams academically and lowering standards um, to fit in to accepted social norms. Um, Rukaya says that uh, I couldn't take up my international position because I'm married and I can't be the breadwinner. These are really fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing all of these interesting ways in which you personally have been affected by unequal gender norms. And so from these examples, you can see everyone is affected some way by gender norms and unfortunately unequal gender norms. Okay, so my last uh, points in the last couple of minutes I wanted to raise uh, some points in how can we address, uh, how can we work with women and girls, men and boys uh, to be able to address 
some issues. Excuse me, sorry. Um, so women's and girls empowerment are activities that we can be undertaking. Um, men and boys engagement or other activities that we can be engaging in and then community dialogues. And the way that we've been doing some of these activities over the years is that we work with women and girls separately. We, in, we um, empower them to build their agency we work separately then with men and boys. This is concurrent, but separate. So men and boys, we engage them to discuss, you know, what are these gender norms? How do they hold you back? How do they hold other women in your lives back? And we get them to discuss and consider things that they probably haven't considered in their life. And then once we've spent enough time with women and girls so they feel comfortable talking about these issues openly, the same with men and boys, then at a later time, we bring people together for community dialogues, uh, intergenerational dialogues. And we, we've seen change over time in communities where we conduct these kinds of activities. This is one way in which we can actually start changing some of these unequal gender norms. Some people might say, oh, it's so hard to change gender norms. It takes a very long time. That is true. I would agree with that. However, I have also seen people change their, change the way they think um, for the better after just a couple of years when we take time to facilitate these conversations with them. Obviously, we can't make people change their minds. All we can do is have them consider certain issues and then encourage them to take up different roles and responsibilities and perhaps uh, um, engage in, in different ways of thinking that can positively influence many people in their family. Um, this is a, a wonderful graphic that shows when power dynamics change, things can change for the better. Okay, so we know the more traditional thinking about, you know, when someone has power over someone else, um, and often we think of the man having more power than the woman in the household or in the work environment. Um, but this is, this is not a, a type of dynamic that is going to benefit anyone. So we then encourage different types of power sharing. So having power within a space where you are sharing information with others, such as a teacher sharing ideas with students. The um, power to do something, to help people who have been uh, um, unfortunately affected by, by violence, um, poverty, other social ills. And then the power with is when you bring people together and you facilitate dynamics of women's engagement, women's um, agency and, uh, and, and livelihoods. And this is an example with, for example, the South Sudan Women's Organization picture here. And my final slide is discussing how we catalyze women's agency and livelihoods when we use the discussion of gender norms and we try to make gender norms more equal. Uh, women and girls will be able to uh, take advantage of these new norms. We see that women are less likely to suffer from gender-based violence. Laws and policies are more likely to favor women's agency and livelihoods. 
men and boys will benefit um, to their health and education from women's agency and livelihoods. And finally, equitable power and decision making will create an, an enabling environment for women's agency and livelihoods. So I'm going to stop there, Kemi. Uh, I'm going to end my sharing. Um, and I'm okay, going I'm to see if there's any final comments or questions or discussion points. Thank you so much. That has been really um, very enlightening and enriching. And then there's so many comments um coming in um so many comments we had some comments coming um you know while you were speaking and there's still some comments that we didn't take um, previously so let me go back to some of the questions that we had um we started with um see how many more we can you can take and then just also read out so many um if we have time just some more interesting um, comments that have come in and um, please if you still have questions feel free to put them into the chat and then we'll try to take um, as many as we can um, briefly before um, we sign out but it's really been interesting just reading the comments and just seeing how um, people have participated so this is a question. It says, women and girls often normalize traditional gender roles that may be beneficial to them, right? So I think this person is seeking for some clarification around that. Uh, sorry, can you just repeat the question? Women and girls often normalize traditional gender roles that may be beneficial to them, right? Of course, of course. So uh, I think traditional gender roles can be beneficial. There's nothing wrong necessarily with traditional gender roles. What will not benefit is when those roles are unequal, meaning that women are at a disadvantage because they're not able to pursue something. Now, if all opportunities are open to me and I still want to pursue a traditional gender role, such as staying home and caring for my children, um, there's nothing wrong with that as long as I've had that discussion with my partner and that we've decided together that that's going to be you know, the situation. Um, so traditional roles in and of themselves, there's nothing wrong with. It's just looking at uh, any disadvantages that the woman faces because of those traditional roles. That's thank you. Say. Yeah, thank you so much. There's another question here. Can we make equity and justice um, systemic and not an afterthought? I think this is this person is thinking aloud. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Some organizations reserve some jobs for men thinking that women will not fit in. What about that? Uh, I think, again, those are, are socially constructed expectations and assumptions. I don't I, I think that um, there are very few positions that men can only do or women can only do especially if it especially if it's something like you know financial issues of course women can manage finances just as as well as men um but we obviously we see that there are more men who go into those positions perhaps because women don't pursue those opportunities in their studies either because they personally don't think that they can do it or because someone has told them in their life that they shouldn't they shouldn't do it yeah okay so uh, people are asking can we get the recording of this webinar yes and um, you can we're going to make this available um after this um session actually i think this will be put on on our youtube page so you'll be able to go back and listen 
um, then on the slides, we'll have to take permission from Dr. Beton and get back to you on that. Um, then there's one last question here. How can men better express healthier masculinity? Oh my goodness, what a wonderful question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think it's very hard for anyone to break out of uh, roles and expectations. If that one person breaks out of them and others don't join them, then they will likely be stigmatized. Yes. So I would say that if there's any opportunity for you to have broader conversations with other men um, and to facilitate those conversations and dialogues, there are so many wonderful resources that you can use to facilitate those conversations with your peers or within you know, uh, groups. There's also a wonderful organization. They have chapters all over the world. It's called the Men Engage Alliance. And uh, I don't know if they, I think they do have a chapter in Nigeria and I can get back to you on that, but they have um, really wonderful resources to help facilitate dialogues uh, with, for men on um, considering different roles and perhaps breaking out of, you know, those, those um, narrowly socially defined roles. Yes, and just to add that, you know, there has been some research around, um, you know, transforming masculinities even in Nigeria. And um, if you reach out, we're happy to share um, some of those resources with you because we're part of some of those um, research um, studies. Just one last question. Talking about gender norms, should we advocate more for e equity or equality and why? Mm, both, <laughs> both. Uh, remember, equity is a pathway to equality. Yeah. So if you are working on equity, then hopefully you're also working towards equality. Yeah. Okay, I think those are all the questions. I'll just read one or two very interesting comments, you know, in the spirit of, you know, ensuring that, you know, we, we've included everyone. Um, culture is actually a very sensitive topic to deal with at community level. In an instance, you conduct a gender analysis and discover traditional practices that are violations of human rights. How do you communicate that and still maintain acceptance? Oh, this is a question. I thought it was actually a comment. So let me just take that again. So it says culture is a sensitive topic to deal with at the community level. So you've conducted your gender analysis you've highlighted some traditional practices that are actually violations of human rights. How do you communicate that and still maintain acceptance by the community members that value such culture? Mm. Okay, so this is a great question. Uh, you know, as a Western, as a Western white woman, I totally recognize that I uh, am, doing this research uh what i all i can do is make sure that first of all i'm doing the research with others uh, in the community or from the community um, and secondly that this information then is shared back with the community lead, community leaders or the religious leaders and if you can bring others um who who are also in similar positions but who have rejected you know the violation of rights and have and have been thinking about things differently it's it's much better to get uh i think they're called positive deviants people who deviate positively from these unequal uh and harmful gender norms and so the so really you want to try to get those influencers who can influence and facilitate those dialogues with the right people Yes, thank you so much. And then just to add from just some little work we have done um, around this sort of things in the past, um, the approaches for community engagement have to be participatory. 
because there has to be that ownership about it's not enough to you know find out that some practices are a violation of human rights and then communicate as the experts you know to them that what you're doing is wrong because you're going to get even into more trouble so whatever approaches um, that you you use um dunan's way have to be you know part there has to be that collective conversations um you know you have to look for those who um, you know, um, the, the, who, who the influencers are, but just make sure that you're not the one communicating. There's a co-creation um, going on around, you know, these conversations. Okay, so just reading final final comments, just a couple of final interesting comments. Um, some women uphold some harmful practices against women in communities. Yeah, we saw a lot of that with... Um, female genital mutilation, where the preservers of the culture were actually uh, women and still speaks to that participatory approach to, to addressing that. And then we have a comment here about, um, you know, someone said, some households make it difficult for single women to rent a house. I couldn't take a regional role that involves traveling because of my daughter without meaningful engage, meaningfully engaging men and boys unwanted um, gender norms may continue to linger. Um, another job, okay, and then someone talks about not being able to take an international job because of her husband. In interviews, discrimination, you know, occurs against family women. I would always give the example of when I was told that, um, you know, my consideration for a role was, was hanging in the balance because I was still in my very active reproductive um, days and you know he's, the the recruiter said to me I can't guarantee that you won't go off having a baby you know six months after I'll prefer to have a man in fact that has happened to me twice um actually so and um, these are things that we see happening every day gender bias is a strong weapon against women occupying certain positions in Nigeria how can this message get to our policymakers to change this norm well like I said earlier I think this is a good place to round up we will continue this conversation at the Gender and Inclusion Summit in November. And um, this has really been a very, very engaging, wonderful, time well spent webinar. And um, thank you so much to, to you, Dr. Beton, for sharing from your rich experience. You've laid a very, very good foundation that we're going to build up on when we take you know, the conversation further and during the gender and inclusion summit, talking about you know shifting and gender um, sh shifting gender norms, looking at harmful and um, traditional practices, and just speaking about opportunities to engage men, opportunities to ensure that we can have very meaningful conversations um, about um, gender equality, gender equity, and advancing um, um, tr um, you know bridging the gaps, you know, and advancing and gender and inclusion through the intersection of trade and health. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. We're going to leave the room open for a few minutes. It's a good opportunity to connect with, with others. Um, I see someone asking how to register for the event. And um, registrations will be open from early October. So if you check our LinkedIn page, our website, you'll get more information about registering for the gender um, and inclusion summit. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Uh, please continue the reflections, continue to engage, learn more, and bring this learning into your um, your work. We'll leave the link, we'll leave this um, webinar open for another five, 10 minutes so people can connect. Um, please can we share the LinkedIn page for the Policy Innovation Center? And um, someone is asking for it. Dr. Batil, thank you so much one more time for spending this afternoon with us. It's been really, really insightful. Thank you. Thank you so much. It really has been. I appreciate uh, everyone's comments and some of some have made very brave comments and yes. shared some personal things with us. And I want to thank them very much for doing so. It's been a pleasure. Yes. And feel free to unmute and say thank you to her. Um, if um, the host would allow us to do that, please feel free to unmute and say thank you as we Say goodbye. Thank you so much.
scholarships for the gender and inclusion course. Um, but unfortunately, I know the scholarship window is closed and they have, um, I think the winners have actually been selected. Um, but I would share um, my colleague's email, Kemi Omole, so you can you can reach out to her and get, you know, any other information about the, the course, you know, Kemi would be able to... Um, Okay, yeah, so Kemi has shared it also. I was just about to share her email address. So please feel free to reach out to Kemi. Also for, um, yeah, and we read her profile at the beginning, but you can reach out to Kemi for that also. Okay, I guess we'll end now. So if you want to learn more about the gender and development course, Dr. Andre has just blown our minds, you know, I'm giving us a teaser. Just reach out and then I would then um, provide you with more information as well. Um, okay, I guess we've come to the end of today's session. Um, please do have a nice day. Thank you. Bye.